Howdy, everybody. Um, today's speaker is Dr. David Sarznecki. Sarznecki, I think I say that right. Um, he is a North American breeding director or manager and senior breeder for Ernest Benari of America. Uh, Benari is a seed propagation company, um, and he will talk more about Benari today. He graduated from Florida in 2011 and 2006, studying Lantana Camara and Coreopsis Levenworthi, Levenworthi? Uh, respectively. His graduate programs focused on ecological preservation and breeding of Lantana. Finally, most importantly, he graduated here with a bachelor's in 2004 from our department. So we're glad to have him back with us, and this will be a great seminar. So please welcome Dr. David Sarsnecki. Should I put this here? Yeah, you want to this. Sure. Howdy. So I'd like to start and just say, you know, thank you all for having me. This really is a, an honor. Um, you know, when I graduated, I'm not exactly sure when, but at some point in time, I always thought it would be really nice to come back and speak someday. Uh, you know, you go to conferences and things of that nature and you give all these presentations and then sometimes the one that really matters is the one that you never did. So, uh, as I said, thank you very much for having me. So uh, I work, as as Mason said, as the North American Breeding Manager um, in California. This uh, th So a lot of what I've got to show you, the first few slides is kind of just um, sort of what where I come from and what I've been up to. Uh, this field right here is actually from our, our field in uh, Hanmunden or Hanover Schmunden, Germany which is sort of in the, the middle of Germany. Um, and this is what our breeding field looks like. Uh, and we, we use this for, for trials and we use it for, uh, for evaluations and for selling it to customers. So a little bit more about us. So it's a family owned company. This is the family. Uh, it's now owned by the, the, two, the, the two adults in the photo. And hopefully one of them, one of the children will take over. They've made it clear that one of them, not all four of them will get it. So that's, that's what they've said. Um, we specialize in, in ornamentals and seed. And specifically, we are the world market leader in begonias. It's the second oldest uh, company in the industry. The only company that's any older is Taki. They're about five years older than us. So as long as they're around, we're still number two. But 180 is not so bad. So a couple of interesting things. You know, Gregor Mendel was actually one of our customers in the past. And so was the Kaiser from Russia. Uh, we have some, there's some photos floating around of actually the Kaiser with, you know, some of Benari products in their garden. Uh, we introduced the first F1 hybrid uh, prima donna, which was a begonia back in 1909. And we actually had seed on the Titanic when it sank. And uh, a couple of years ago for April Fools, we offered that seed for sale. We said, oh, hey, uh, we've got some seed off the Titanic and you will not believe how many orders we had. Um, then if, uh, also uh, 1927, we introduced the first uh, F1 vegetable tomato um, heterosis. Or, uh, you know, and so we have a long history is kind of what it comes down to. So sometimes when you have a long history and you're the market leader, something cool happens. You get your product in front of the White House. Now, you know, I don't breed begonias, but that kind of makes me wish I did, right? Uh, I breed pentas, which is also red. So, you know, maybe we can work that out. But nonetheless, uh, sometimes cool things happen in life. So Benari, uh, even though we're, uh, we're one of the smaller companies, we're still in the top tier, but we, uh, we like, we're able to distribute our seed across the entire globe. There's really no country that we don't uh, try to serve if, we, if we're able to. Our biggest markets are, the, are North America, China, and Europe. Uh, then we sort of look at the rest of the world collectively, and that's really all managed through Europe. So we maintain eight, eight locations globally. Uh, we have four breeding locations. Uh, we, have, we have one in Germany, uh, one in the Netherlands, uh, Watsonville, California, where I'm located. And then we have a, a new facility in Xiamen, China. Uh, that's that was started about two years ago. We have two production locations, one in Guatemala and Chile. I'll be in Guatemala, I think in two weeks. So I'm kind of excited about that. And then we have a production facility in China. Um, so that's kind of the, the general uh, gist of, of the size and the scope of our company. So we're big enough to where we can do just about anything, but we're not so large that we have uh, we have more than what we what we need. So let's go through this a little bit. So over the years, so in 2004, I graduated. Um, I feel like uh, I feel like my hair has been shifting down my face over the years. But nonetheless, uh, you know, I graduated in 04 in horticulture. I was very happy to be here. And then as uh, as was said, I, I went to University of Florida. Uh, I tried to, to go to graduate school here, didn't quite work out. Um, but, you know, I think I'm glad that I went to Florida because I gained a little bit of experience there and uh, studied Coreopsis Leavenworthii and Lantana Camara, uh, 
Coreopsis as, as a diploid, uh, Lantana as a polypoid, so that was interesting. Both of them had a little bit of molecular work involved in them. And then uh, right after graduation in 2011, I was a postdoc for precisely two months, and then I took a vacation and moved to California. Uh, so then since then, um, I don't think I've extracted DNA since 2010 or 11, all right? And I haven't really looked at any molecular markers, probably with the exception of maybe papers that put them in front of me, uh, maybe more than five or six times since then. Um, but, you know, apparently I did an okay enough job and eventually I became the senior breeder at my location. And then a few years later, they made me the, the breeding manager for the location. Well, over the years, uh, I've worked on about 17 crops. I might've forgotten a few, but that's in the ballpark of it. I've released 15 varieties, which is kind of nice, but uh, maybe I could have released more, maybe uh, a little bit less, and I've gotten a few awards. So that's been a pretty nice career, um, you know, at least in my mind. Um, and I'm happy with it to this point. So what's the main point that I want to get out here? How many of you in this audience are breeders or want to be? Okay. Well, you're not allowed to ask any questions. All right. Uh, no, I, I, I want to recognize that a lot of you in this audience might actually know more than I do about a few things uh, or maybe a lot of things. Who knows? But what I do know is I know how to go into a greenhouse and make selections. Okay, so currently, uh, these are some of my main projects that I work on, uh, Rudbeckia, Zinnia, uh, Marigolds, uh, these are actually French, but I work on African, uh, Pentas, Dianthus, and then Portulaca was one that I, I recently got onto the market. So life is full of changes and opportunities, and I think I mentioned earlier today, when I was going in for my job interview, I said, uh, I don't want to breed Marigolds. And my, my boss, my future boss then said to me, uh, are you sure about that? And I said, yeah, I'm pretty sure. And he said, I'll give you another chance. And I said, yeah, okay, I'll do whatever you tell me to do. So, so I bred marigolds, all right? Turned out to be a pretty good thing. And I actually wound up liking them. So you never know when someone says, oh, I really want to go do something uh, or I really don't want to go do something. Sometimes when you actually do it, you find an appreciation that you didn't realize you would have. So moving into the, uh, the, the polyploids, well, there's a lot of them. I mean, and this is not by any, chance, any means a comprehensive list, but here's some popular ones, right? So the ones with the uh, with the with the uh, stars next to them are some crops that I have some experience with, and you know what I'll tell you basically is you know if you know going into it that it's it's a polyploid crop, you know it's going to be a little bit more challenging for certain you know in certain ways. So do you just say oh no I'm not going to do it? No, you don't. You say I'm going to probably move forward if the if the reason is there. So that's why I say to breed or not to breed. Well, very few people are going to sit there and say no I'm going to stop. I mean, unless you have no, you know, no real capacity or ability, you're still going to give it a shot. So what's, uh, what, what do you, what, what, what's the difference? Well, polyploids are a little bit more complex. It's harder to fix traits. Um, you know, for the seed side of things, it's actually pretty similar to diploids. You still have to fix the traits uh, if you're going to use them for OPs or if you're going to use them for parent lines. Vegetatively, the product might come a little bit faster than if it was uh, from, from a seed. Uh, with a vegetative product, basically, you know, you wind up with, as soon as you see it, it's ready to go. Um, I guess that's kind of true. I mean, you have to still do a little bit of evaluation, but that's how it works. Um, you know, with polyploids, there's higher level of, uh, levels of diversity that are possible. And, you know, the way that I like to look at it is when you, when you start with an uh, open pollinated crop, which is more or less inbreeding, you have a very limited range. Then when you move out to a, to a hybrid or F1, you get a, a wider range of what's possible. And then when you go to vegetative, anything that that crop can do is what you can get. So you get the whole rainbow of whatever that crop can offer to you. So, you know, um, I would say that generally speaking, I think that the real innovation or the real, the real tough work is actually in seed breeding. It takes a lot more craftsmanship to really fix those lines and to get them ready. But that doesn't mean that vegetative breeding is, is necessarily easy. But I think that the selection work is where, where things really are, are involved um, when it comes to veg when it comes to polyploids and vegetative breeding. So, you know, uh, sterile offspring might be more common if you have varied ploidy levels. If, you're, if your entire species is all the same ploidy, it should be relatively straightforward. But uh, if you have varied ploidy levels, then of course, uh, sterility is going to pop up occasionally, but you might be happy with that. So it could be okay. So polyploid breeding, what are you breeding for? Well, you know, in, in some of the classical texts, they say, oh, polyploids might have larger flowers or bigger fruit or some sort of sterility, um, environmental tolerances. Uh, you know, there's, you got to kind of decide what you're, what you're going after. And this, uh, this is a picture of, of the, uh, the Lantana field that I had in Florida. Um, it was uh, an interesting field. And I think I found a bobcat in there once. So that was kind of fun. 
But uh, anyway, uh, what are what are your goals? Are you going to try and go with a vegetative proc, pro crop, or are you going to try and have a, a seed propagated, um, you know, crop? And everything offers an opportunity, so you just kind of have to know where you're going to go. What I'll say is this: one thing I wish that I had when I was in graduate school that I did not have was product management. Uh, and so the way that our company works, and I think most companies, you have breeding managers. Uh, there's a global head of breeding that's above me. Uh, and so I'm the regional manager. So basically anything that goes on at my facility, I have to deal with. Uh, but the global, the global breeding manager more or less sets direction for the entire company. Then you have to have uh, a production department that has to have the capacity and the knowledge to produce these things. And then you have to have portfolio management. This is what we were missing. All right. We didn't necessarily have, you know, anyone other than basically saying, oh, we want to make sterile. Uh, lantana that's safe for the environment, that was really the only goal that we had, all right? Uh, we kind of knew that we needed something that was attractive, but we didn't really know, uh, we, we didn't have a lot of other direction beyond that. So portfolio management is, I think, one of the biggest things that was missing uh, at that stage of my career. And then how do you get it to market? Do you need to protect it? And so on and so forth. So the program, um, the goal, as I said, was to make uh, Florida-friendly lantana. We started with 34 unprotected varieties or, or open and free varieties. Um, we were very, very nervous to, to, to take any kind of uh, proprietary genetics. And I think I would probably be less, um, less cautious about that now, knowing what I know. But because we were at a university and wanted to play friendly, we did not do that. Uh, the crossing work was done between 2006 to 2008. And so I kind of had this idea as I started racking up numbers. I was like, oh man, I'm pollinating flowers all day long. I'm sowing all kinds of seed. And uh, I probably counted a little more pollen than I should have. But uh, I was like, oh, I'm going to get to a million somehow. Didn't get there. Uh, even after all the work I did, I got to almost you know, half a million. So uh, I was a little disappointed when I started adding up the numbers. But uh, 367,000 uh, pollen grains um, was a lot. But it was necessary uh, because of the way that we set up our, our uh, experimental design. So we didn't really set a certain number of pollen grains to count. We just sort of set slides and then you just had to count what you found. So that's kind of why the number got so high. But um, what do we have? Well, we had field and garden beds. That's pretty standard. We had greenhouses and cold frames, again, pretty standard. And then we had a, a general, uh, general lab and a molecular lab. So that's the molecular lab is something that not every uh, company or, or breeder is going to have access to. So we were a little bit lucky in that sense. So uh, for those of the, you that aren't familiar with polyploids, I'm going to just read this uh, verbatim. Polyploids are euploids in which the somatic cells possess multiples of complete basic chromosome sets in excess of the diploid number. So in other words, however, whenever you have a, a basic chromosome set, it starts to increase for every uh, increase in ploidy. So a triploid has three sets, tetraploid has four, pentaploid, hexaploid, septaploid, octaploid. Within Lantana, uh, when we started, they started, everything uh, that the germplasm that we had varied or ranged from a diploid all the way up to a hexaploid just before we, we even started doing any kind of work. So we had a pretty wide range of material available to us. So then autopolyploids are those that, are, that actually double their own genome. So you don't bring in any uh, additional genomes, you just, bring, you just double your own. And then an allopolyploid brings in a genome from another species. So uh, allopolyploids, a good example of that is something like a zinnia or a strawberry. Those, ha those have uh, multiple genome sets and there's potential value or, or uh, benefits from that. So um, polypore, so normal reproduction in Lantana, as I said, it's the, so we're gonna, uh, so I kind of, there's a lot of ploy ploidy levels involved in Lantana, but by default, I'm kind of gonna refer to things sort of like as diploids and go from there. So diploid Lantana has 22 chromosomes and during regular uh, embryogenesis, you have uh, you have two normal gametes that come together to form a, a diploid embryo. If you have an unreduced female gamete, then you would get it uh, with a regular male, then you would get a triploid. And then if you had the reverse with a normal female with an unreduced male, you would also get a triploid. And then if you had double unreduced gametes, you would then get a tetraploid. Okay, so let's see what that looks like. So the, the uh, left is the female and the, male is, and the male is on the right. And so if you merge the two together, you get a triploid. Pretty straightforward, all right? Um, and then below it, we're, is, the, uh, is the meiotic process. So you have the mega, megaspore mother cell, goes through a series of meiotic div divisions, and then it eventually creates the, the egg. And then you have fertilization um, with, uh, uh, you have fertilization of the egg. And that's how it generally works. So this is, I was pretty proud of this slide. 
I think it took me about two weeks to make this. Um, but basically, there's uh, there's a lot of things going on in Lantana. Uh, so you first of all have the meiotic process. So you have reduced male and female gametes. That's that's considered to be normal. Then you have unreduced male gametes, which we consider to be very rare. Um, I think in all the plants that I study, I think I found one individual that maybe was an unreduced male gamete. Then uh, you have something that we found that we had unreduced female gametes. Uh, so in other words, what we were able to figure out was that Lantana was bypassing regular meiosis, and this was creating unreduced female gametes. And it was genetically controlled. I was able to make a cross and a hybrid, uh, and it was able to be transferred with the pollen. So in other words, I had an unreduced female gamete producing plant, crossed it with one that did not do this, and then the progeny of that on the uh, from the female uh, then inherited that trait from the male. So it was genetically controlled. Uh, I highly doubt the pollen moved anything else other than genes. So, um, but now what was interesting about this is that this is highly effective at preventing sterility. Lantana is one of the worst and most noxious weeds in the world. Well, this starts to help make sense as to why the plant is so uh, prolific and so invasive. You just can't kill it, right? So, uh, and basically what we, what we made the assumption was that it was restoring fertility and it was likely a first division restitution uh, issue because normally under the uh, first step, the first uh, division, you would get an unbalanced uh, division and that would cause a failure in meiosis and that's why the, the plants become sterile. But because it was bypassing that, this wasn't the case. So when you put the whole thing together, what do you wind up with? You, you have seven different ways of, of, making, uh, of making an embryo. You have at the very top, you have normal uh, meiosis and, and normal uh, fertilization. Then you have the next step, you have uh, normal females with uh, unreduced males, which is rare, but okay. Then you also have a, no, a, a reduced female, but then you can go through apomixis. So then you can get a haploid or you can get, or you can get a, a clone. Then you go down to the next level and you get unreduced females that can go be uh, that can be fertilized. And then you get an increase in plody level, or you can actually get, um, you can also get an apomictic individual that way as well. And then finally, there's the opportunity that we found uh, on rare occasions, you actually had double unreduced gametes. So we had to come up with some sort of a model that would propose how that might happen. So basically lots of things going on. I don't know that there's, I'm sure there's probably other species that are either as complicated or maybe similar, but I'm not sure that there's that many. So how did we know this? Well, aside from the fact that I did a lot of flow cytometry, um, this might've been one of, one of the last gels that I ever ran. Um, and basically what we figured out was that the, the, the alleles for the female were invariant. So we assumed we basically came to the conclusion that the, uh, the female was not, was not segregating. So therefore it was basically just, just bypassing meiosis. And that's, that's how it was able to create a, uh, a, uh, a, an, a, an embryo that was, that was uh, fertilizable. So uh, it, it always re uh, was resulting in these increases of, of 2N plus N fertilization re uh, events. And eventually, if you get through a population uh, that was just sort of out in the open, if you had a plant that was producing, that was a diploid, and then it produced an unreduced gamete, then it would start to produce triploids. Well, if that trait is heritable, then the triploid progeny would also have this ability. So then it would create a triploid uh, a, a triploid, uh, you know, embryo, and then if it was or a triploid gamete that was that could then be fertilized by the diploids because they would they're all perennial, so they all exist together. And then if it was effectively back crossed, then you would wind up with tetraploids. Well, guess what? That restores fertility for the males. So this is part of the reason why lantana was always so pernicious as a weed. So as I said before, basically the the, the meiotic uh, division, the first division restitution, that's the step where we were having the issue or where, where it bypasses and that's how it re restores its fertility. So this, uh, this next set of slides is kind of, uh, it's a lot, so I'll try to go slow. So under normal open pollination, if you had a, po if you had a population of diploid to hexaploid uh, individuals, this is what you could kind of expect to see. So you have, uh, you have the opportunity where hexaploids can make hexaploids, they can make pentaploids, uh, you know, tetraploids. And so on. So there's that's uh, so there's all these opportunities, and this is just under normal uh, open pollination. So now, if you look at what happens under under uh, when you add in the unreduced female gametes, everything is always increasing. So you always have an in increase, and and actually, eventually, by the time that I had uh, spent several years, I I had created at least one uh, septiploid. Uh, or 7X individual. And I think I might've had one octoploid as well. But basically there, there did not seem to be a limit to how far you could go, but you did start to see some weird 
uh, phenotypes in the plants as you started to increase the progeny, uh, or as, as you started to increase your ploidy level. I think maybe if you, if I actually had done breeding at the octoploid level or something like that, maybe they would have sorted themselves out a little bit and maybe some of the genes that had high levels of dosing maybe would have reduced and maybe they would have become a little bit more normal, but okay, that was work for somebody else to do. So then if you look at apomixis, this is what you could have expected. So it wasn't just straight apomixis because you had apomixis where it would create clones and then you had apomixis that would create haploids. I'm not sure too many plants do this, but okay. So now lantana spaghetti. This is, this is what was going on, and this is what I had to sort out when I was in graduate school. Uh, my professor was very concerned with the amount of money I spent on flow cytometry dye. Um, but I think eventually when I, when I sorted it out and presented it to him, uh, this was about a four or five hour conversation that I just had to start writing on a piece of paper until eventually he said, okay, I got it. So uh, if it seems a little confusing, it was confusing for him as well. All right, and this and, and I and I came to this conclusion over the course of months and years, not just over you know a fifteen minute se seminar or, or one hour seminar. Okay, so um, so now that kind of lays the groundwork for the rest of the things that we that that I did uh, while I was there. So the first thing that we're going to look at is the female fertility. Well, uh, what do you if you if they're they're grouped by ploidy levels, and so some of this makes sense and some of it doesn't make sense. And if I hadn't laid out the unreduced female gametes prior, this slide might make no sense. On the, on the left axis, you see the, the amount of fruit or the amount of seed that the plants were making. And on the bottom, you can see the names of the varieties. The most important thing is to focus on the, the colored bars and that they're grouped by floydy levels. So the diploids made some seed, the triploids made some seed. Are triploids supposed to make seed? Probably not, but there were two of them that made very little seed or no seed. And then we had uh, tetraploids that make, made some seed and one that was off the chart. Pentaploids and hexaploids making some seed kind of made some sense. Okay, well, as I said, all of those individuals that were making significant amounts of seed all had this unreduced female gamete trait. Well, this made sense, all right? And then the two that did not, did not have the trait. So, okay, it's a good thing I explained that before, otherwise we would have been very confused. So then we look at male sturdy. Well, this was a little bit more, a uh, little bit more normal. What do we found? We grouped employee levels again. The diploids all had relatively high levels of, of pollen fertility. The triploids were a little bit varied, but generally low. Tetraploids, were, uh, were in the ballpark of medium high. Pentaploids were a little higher than you might expect, but okay, for lantana, it seemed pretty normal. And then uh, the hexaploids were also a little bit lower, but again, for lantana, it seemed pretty normal. I think what I would probably say with lantana is that pretty much everything seemed normal. You know, after you started working through it, there wasn't really much that surprised me. So what did we do with all this information? Well, the University of Florida, uh, had an invasive plant council. And if you wanted to release a variety in the state of, of Florida, uh, whether it was through the university or uh, through private, if you wanted to have it released and get this seal of approval, you had to run it through this uh, council. So what did we do? Well, there was a native species called Lantana depressa. That was the one that we were concerned with trying to preserve. And we used Lantana chimera, which was the invasive species as the male. And so I looked at using the, the pollen from all these individuals uh, you know, and, and so we made the crosses, or I should maybe say I made the crosses, but okay. Uh, so the, the, the diploids were the most compatible. Lantana depressa is also diploid, so it made sense that that made seed, although not always do interspecific crosses make seed. The triploids made very, very little seed. Uh, turns out that the one that made some seed actually was one of the triploids that had higher levels of, of pollen staining. And then the tetraploids made some seed as well. Again, falls in line with what you might expect. Pentaploids also kind of fall in line with what you would expect based on the the pollen fertility that we showed and then the, the hexaploids as well. So now let's look at the reverse situation. If you used Lantana chimera as the female, so that means we use then Lantana depressa as the male. And what you'll see is that the uh, the diploids were non were, were non unreduced female gametes. They made lots of seed, no problem. The non unreduced female gamete triploids, which were only two of them, made very little seed. But okay, that's fine. And then the unreduced female gamete tr uh, producing triploids made lots of seed. So did the, the tetraploids and the pentaploids and the hexaploids also made reasonably uh, high levels of seed. So, okay. So that wasn't uh, exactly uh, reassuring, but you basically what we confirmed was that yes, they are intermating and that yes, lantana chimera is a problem. All right. So what do we, what do we come up with? Well, this little, this picture right here is a picture of lantana depressa. It looks a lot like lantana chimera. There was a professor named Sandy Wilson 
when I picked up these plants in South Florida and Fort Pierce, she said, oh, let me take your picture. You're going to want this picture someday. And I said, okay. Took me about 12 years to want that picture, but okay, I wanted it. Um, so regardless, that's that's what that is. And so that that's uh, Lantana Depressa. And like, it looks actually like a variety called new, uh, gold or new gold. And it may actually be quite possible that those varieties of gold actually integrest from, from the native species. And that's how they how they have those colors or traits. But this is also, uh, these are also some pictures of what the pollen staining was looking like. So I used uh, lactophenol cotton blue. I came up with a little bit of a protocol on this. And if you're really interested, I'm more than happy to share it with you. But essentially what the, the, the clear pollen grains were the ones that we considered to be bad. So they had to be clear and then they had to be basically um, malformed. We considered them uh, abnormal or poor or bad pollen. And the ones that were completely round and, and deeply stained, we considered to be viable pollen grains. Uh, we tried, uh, I tried 20 different methods for pollen germination. And of the 20 different methods, I had one pollen grain, one time germinate. So this was not a very effective thing for me to be doing. So I, I kind of stopped that. And so we went with pollen staining instead. So um, what we found was that uh, when there was high pollen sterility, no fruit set made sense. When there was low pollen uh, fertility, which is those triploids that had roughly 20% pollen staining, you did get fruit set. So this was not safe. So what were the implications of this? Well, pollination is possible uh, and it confirmed the invasive potential. Now, this is an ethical question. Does a good breeder stop here? If you know it's an invasive and you know you're trying to protect a native species, do you make the crosses? I mean, do you breed with it? You know, as I said, maybe that, uh, if, that if that golden color was missing in the Lantana chimera, you'd say, oh, I can move this color in. Or maybe there's some other attributes. But do you stop? Does a good breeder stop here? It's a, it's a real ethical question. What do you do? But it does show you that it can be done. So we were able to generate a nice regression curve that more or less said anything under the about 10 to 15 cent is, uh, percent pollen staining is relatively safe for the uh, uh, for a release. We tended to go with, uh, because it was uh, relatively easy and straightforward to get plants that had less than 5% pollen staining, we tended to go for any plant that had less than 5% pollen staining. And then once you controlled for that, and then controlled for the fact that the plant didn't have unreduced female gametes uh, or as a trait, more or less you had a pretty sterile plant. So that was kind of cool. So after all of this work that I did, I had all these plants and all these populations, I came up with a bright idea. Let's do extra work. So this is one of these places where the, uh, the classical text meets the real world. So what did I generate? So I had on the top, we had some of my uh, my standards that were the commercial varieties that I was working with commonly. In the middle, we had a, a cultivar called Pink Caprice and the bottom was gold. All right, now, Pink Caprice and gold are both tetraploids. And I was able to generate diploids, triploids, tetraploids, pentaploids, and hexaploids from both of those individuals. All right, so the diploids came from Apomixis, the triploids came from, from straight standard breeding, Tetraploids were either apomictic or just from regular pollination. Pentaploids and hexaploids came from unreduced female gametes. All right. So I thought it was a bright idea to go ahead and see, hey, what happens if you actually try and use these similar genetic backgrounds and try to apply some uh, some physiology to this? So there's a uh, there, there's a form another former Aggie, Jeff Denny. Some of you all might know him. Uh, he graduated, I think, a few years after I did from here, uh, I think maybe 2008 or so with his PhD, and then he joined the University of Florida. He happened to be at my location. Uh, we were fast friends because of our because of knowing each other from, from my time here. And he needed he was a young professor and needed some work, and I was very interested in this. So we did some physiological work, and what we looked at was photosynthetic rates uh, after drought. So the, the idea was to say, oh, okay, well, so does polyploidy actually offer you any additional advantage uh, when it comes to drought stress. So the idea basically was to run through the materials pretty quick was we had all the varieties and we would bring them to drought stress. And as soon as they were drought stressed, we would look at the photosynthetic rates. And so the graphs here basically show you the higher the graph, the higher the, the rate uh, shows you the higher the photosynthesis was going on. In other words, the plants did not shut down. Well, this was an unfortunate event because basically what we found out was that plody level had really no, no effect on this. And it actually really was probably more genetic control than anything else. So this kind of didn't really show that ploidy really had so much of an effect. Now, I will say that um, this is this is a little bit of a of an uncontrolled experiment because you know we didn't control for the for the populations perfectly. We would have had to really start with the exact same inbred lines and really build them up to to do this perfectly. But nonetheless, it didn't seem that ploidy was a clear a, a clear factor right off the bat. 
but it still was kind of an interesting study and that was never published. So if anyone wants something, I'll, you know, I'm more than happy to give you the data. Um, but uh, that, so that was, but it was an interesting study and I did a few other things there and I, I learned some lessons and I learned how to wake up at three o'clock in the morning to do pressure bombs. So that was fun. So uh, let's look at apomixis. So, uh, so to, to kind of just, just, uh, just, lay how we know that we had epimixis. We did have some markers that showed that, that basically the plants were clonal. And um, what you can see here, are, uh, or they were, they were progeny of the, of the females, so they, these weren't clonal, but you can see the segregation in the, in the alleles. And so when, when you look at the left, uh, that's the, the parent line, and then to the right are the haploids. So you can see that there's some changes. And so some of the genes got lost uh, whenever they were being haploidized. So the left, uh, F, so A is pink caprice, and then you can see some changes, and then F is uh, gold, and you can see some changes in the, in the morphology of the flowers. So it's kind of an interesting thing. And you know, when you're when you're breeding, you don't expect these things to happen, and so then all of a sudden you start getting results, and you're like, well, what's going on here? You know, if it weren't for the fact that I had sown the seed myself, I might not believe what was happening. You know, don't believe your lion eyes. So now let's look at some ap some other apomictic phenotypes. These are actually clones. So basically the, the plant, uh, so the photo on the left, uh, the A and then the, the, the A123. So A is the, the progenitor female, and then one, two, three are actually clones, but they're apomictic seed from the female. And then we have uh, the same thing with B, C, D, E, F, G. Now there's one interesting one here. That's the double unreduced female gamete. So what happened there? Well, now that one actually falls in line with what you would expect, a polyploid, the flowers look more, uh, they look larger and they look more well-developed and things of that nature. So that was kind of an interesting one. And if that wasn't enough fun, twins. Again, if I hadn't sown the seed myself, I might not believe it, right? You know, as I, as I kept looking at these plants, I was like, how did I get two plants in this cell? Well, it turns out that there were actually two, two individuals per seed, which is not normal, but it was two separate fertilization events. Um, and so, you know, it was just kind of an interesting thing, but man, this crop really gave you a lot of headaches. So, you know, I really, I'm telling you, you know, this is one of those times where doing the work yourself is sometimes beneficial. You know, if you have a technician that's helping you, they're great. And technicians are sometimes what you need in life, but sometimes you got to do it yourself. Otherwise you're just going to always be confused. And this is one of those times where I'm glad I did it myself. So let's talk about the, the summary of the, of the program. Well, diploids, um, diploids were generally lower vigor. They had a looser and open habit. They normally produced more seed and had better pollen viability, but they only had white and yellow tones in general. Tetraploids were much wider in, in uh, variability. They had, a lot of, they had a lot more vigor. You had some that were, I think when I was at Florida on main campus, I think I saw like a 20 or 30 foot plant. I mean, it was just massive. Then just I think it was like it was growing down in a ditch and they just let it grow straight up the, the hill. And I'm just like, man, that's a 30 foot plant. So, OK, but uh, but typically uh, polyploids or the, the tetraploids had, you know, they ranged from open and erratic habits to mounding, which was quite attractive. And then in some cases trailing and spreading, which is also very attractive. But they, they gave you a wide range in uh, seed and pollen viabilities. But they did have uh, the entire color range, with the exception of pure whites and pure yellows. They had golden tones, but not pure pure whites and yellows. Triploids had intermediate habits. Whatever you cross them with, almost everything was sort of uh, co-dominant. You know, whenever you would cross one thing with the other, you'd usually wind up with some sort of intermediate. Uh, but what the problem was is basically is that if you wanted a really intense color, you had a red uh, as a female and that, or as, a, as, a, as one parent, and then you would cross it with the diploid, we'd wind up with some sort of washed out red or a pink or some color that we weren't really very interested in. So this didn't work out so well. So some of the breeding goals that I had, you know, developed on my own, because we didn't have product managers telling us what to do. Um, I just said, okay, I need to move these genes over into the diploid background. Well, that's not exactly, that's sort of one of those things that's easier said than done. All right, now, by the end of the program, we had found apomictic plants. So that was kind of cool. So uh, inadvertently, I got to where I wanted to be, you know, just, just by just doing some good screening work, because basically what we had was we had a couple of individuals that were tetraploid that made apomictic haploids. Well, guess what? Now, all of a sudden, I had diploids that had color. Well, this was unfortunately too late in my program. And, you know, my professor was able to carry that work forward and not myself. But nonetheless, that was the idea is that we needed to get those genes on both sides to make a good, a good hybrid. Now, if you want to talk about it philosophically for a second, you could say, oh, well, 
you know, if you cross a good diploid with a good tetraploid, you could actually make an F1 hybrid that would then be sterile from a seed. But being that you only get one seed per pollination and lantana is kind of a difficult thing to pollinate, this isn't really practical. But okay. So then what else did I find out? Well, there was a, there was a triploid, Lucky Red Hot Improved, that did not have the, trip, the uh, unreduced female gamete traits. And I was able to make some hard crosses where I was able to generate some aneuploids. And we, we looked at that with, uh, with flow cytometry. So we had a triploid and a tetraploid and the aneuploid was kind of just right in the middle. So it indicated to me that it was possible to move these genes around if you were willing to kind of uh, beat your head against the wall a little bit. So, um, you know, basically when we, when we would uh, go through all this, you know, th there was a lot of things going on. And ultimately, I, I feel like it was a pretty, um, you know, it was a pretty good, a, a pretty interesting program. So we generated a robust program with medium long-term scope. They're still working on it right now. There's a graduate, pro there's a graduate student right now working on the transcriptome. Um, there, we had two uh, sterile uh, varieties that were patented uh, when I was there. And then there was actually uh, some work that was uh, adopted from Ball Horticulture called uh, Bloomify. And it's still an active program. Uh, but then from the standpoint of research, there's been marker development studies uh, they're still looking at they're looking at the transcriptome, I believe, of the uh, unreduced female gametes. And then we also were able to look at native species preservation. I don't believe that when I went into graduate school, I really cared about native species. But after spent spending seven years studying them, I have a little bit of sensitivity for it now. So I, I would kind of say it's one of those things where uh, if you don't care about them, maybe study a little bit and then you might care a little bit more. Who knows? But so here's the good and the bad. So the picture, so the individuals on the left, uh, UF T3 and T4 were the varieties that I came up with um, that had absolutely zero commercial success, but they were released nonetheless. Um, I think they 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 uh, led to at least sort of a, a path to um, the Bloomify, which did have commercial success. So once those varieties were on the market and they sort of worked out the path to introduction and the path to a safe product, then it became clear that something like this was was actually a viable product. And so Bloomify Red, I'm actually the grandfather of that because I generated the, the, the plants that became, uh, that became the parents uh, for that cross and then Bloomify Rose. And then I, I talked to my professor about it. And he said, oh yeah, we lost the parent lines. I was like, oh, well, isn't that nice? So, uh, so I guess he had to start all over again. But uh, nonetheless, that's kind of just how, how it goes sometimes. So be careful. Okay, so... That was sort of a, a primer for, for basically everything that happened uh, up to my uh, time in, in my professional development now. So I, as I said, I've been with my company for about 12 years and you know, polyploid ratios, what do you do? Well, as I said, it's a little bit more complicated. Why, are, why is there a picture of pots? Oh yeah, I know why. Because the pots tell you how many plants you're gonna grow. How big is your population gonna be? All right, do you, do you, use, do you use a gallon pot? Do you use a 32 cell tray? Do you use a 36 cell tray? Do you use a 288 plug cell tray? What do you do? When you put something in the field, how big is your field plot? Is it 18 plants? Is it 24 plants? Is it how, and then how many of them do you have, right? So this picture in the middle here is uh, French, our French marigolds and you can see the nice segregation. All right, now that population is segregating nicely, but we'll talk about that in a second when I show you the next slide. So that's two trays of, of 32 cells each, so 64 plants. But because the, the segregation is, is quite high, it's pretty clear. So as I said, it's a little bit more complicated. So on the left, you have the genotypes, and on the right, you have the phenotypes. All right? So um, for those of you that are familiar with this kind of stuff, it might make a little bit easier sense. But basically what it comes down to is on the left, the genotypes, which you can see is that there's a lot of genotypes happening. But when you look at the phenotypes, not so many. If this was a diploid, it would be a much simpler equation. I thought about putting that on there, but I said, no, we'll just, we'll just leave it complicated, right? Um, so basically what it comes down to is when you have the, 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 quad, the, the quadruplex or the triplex in the top, when you self-pollinate them, you have, no clue what's you have no clue that you have anything that's not fixed. You just don't know, all right? So if, if your goal is to try and fix a dominant trait, this is not exactly an easy thing to be doing. Okay, so uh, until, until you get to a subsequent generation, this is just not something that you can work out. So how do you, how do you look into this? Well, uh, as I said, only one in four of them will segregate and only one in four of them is fixed. So what do you do? Well, I have my own strategy. Um, I take about 12 to 16 plants and I self-pollinate all of them. And then what's required is you then have to look at all of those populations to confirm that all of them are fixed. And if they're all fixed, you're good. 
If they're not all fixed, you got to start over. So, but why do I take so many? It's only one in four. Well, with diploids and the work that I've done, uh, I've had heterozygous uh, individuals, or at least a population that was segregating. And I said, okay, I've got to try and fix this trait, or I've got to try and find the heterozygote. I've taken some that I've taken up to six individuals before and had all of them be homozygous. And I was just like, that's not how this is supposed to work. You know, and then I've taken other other times where I've looked trying to fix one, and I'll take, oh, you know, seven or eight individuals and say, okay, one of them will, will be homozygous. No. So you really have to get a lot of numbers to really be sure about this. Now, alternatively, if you had molecular markers, that would help you. All right, that would help you if you had the right marker for the exact trait, that would help you get, fix this a little bit more easily. Here's another alternative. If you have a if you have a recessive uh, tester, and depending on your on your on your uh, the morphology of your plant, if, if making hybrids is easy, you can make the cross. All right, and so when you make the cross, uh, if the plants if if your if your plants are uh, you know when you make the cross, if you have the the dominant all if you have the homozygous uh, dominant, all of them will be will be uh, the the dominant phenotype, and if you have the triplex, they'll all be the dominant phenotype. So you're still not quite done there either, but. Uh, if you have if you have the recessive uh, phenotype or the the duplex, then you would get one in five, all right. And then if you and then even when you do that, you need to go ahead and look at quite a few populations uh, still. So if you look at about eight populations, you make these crosses. Uh, you can you can glean some information from them this way. So I don't know if this is actually easier to make crosses. It really depends on the on the the type of plants that you have, and this even kind of ignores if you have uh, if you have self incompatibility or other issues that might might complicate matters. But nonetheless, uh, it just depends on your on your crop. So now let's look at uh, what happens if you get a uh, if you get two genes involved. Well, a double recessive. Uh, well, one out of about thirteen hundred plants. Now you're not always interested in getting the double recessive, but um, are you willing to grow out thirteen hundred plants to find something? And are you willing to try and take the chance that that one plant that you're looking for lives? Just think about it. So um, then uh, now let's look at the uh, what that looks like phenotypically. Well, okay. So if you're looking for recessive, if you're looking for recessive traits, you know maybe you don't have to bite it all off in the same generation. Maybe you can look start with one of the one of the recessives, and then you can you can try and uh, get the next one in the next generation. Because when you select for one of them, then the the uh, dominant is still likely segregating for the for the trait that you're uh, looking for as the double recessive. So you can kind of step through it in a couple of generations. So uh, if you're looking for homozygous uh, plants, there's only one out of about 300, which is still not very many. I mean, so like I said, you know, when, when, you're, when you're thinking about things as a graduate student, uh, you know, are you willing to invest that kind of time and effort? Um, you know, currently, when I look at a breeding cycle, it's usually anywhere from 30 to 60,000 plants. And if you have to look at basically, you know, 1,000 to 2,000 plants to just fix one trait for one, one lineage, that's a pretty significant investment for just one thing out of your entire program. Is it really that important? But if you're not playing those kinds of numbers, you might not really get what you want. So lessons learned, get creative, lay your groundwork. Uh, what if it works? So what if you catch the tiger by the tail? What are you gonna do? Well, you've gotta, you gotta be ready for that. Um, if, you're, you know, if you breed a product and all of a sudden it's pretty special and you have no outlet for it, it just sits there. And maybe it gets a virus, maybe it dies. Maybe someone else sees it, and then they say, oh, that's a great idea, and then they, then they take the same idea. So you've got to be ready uh, if something good actually does happen. Uh, you got to keep good records. Genomes and polity levels are kind of like, uh, kind of like pedigrees. you got to keep them straight. you got to, you got to know what you're, uh, what you're working with. Um, usually, it's a good idea to know where you start before you start working. Um, I've been guilty of not doing that. Um, I tend to just dive in and just get going. The more species I've worked on... Um, uh, has led me to believe that, you know, or has caused me to do that more than than I should. But generally, you know, speaking, a, a simple Wikipedia search or internet search will give you some information about a crop, uh, some simple papers. You all have access to all kinds of papers. Use them. I have to pay every single time I want a paper. So please, you know, you have access to them. Look them up. Use them. It'll tell you what your polity levels are, or some basic things. I mean, there's a lot of information available. Use it. But if you don't have that, self-pollinate. There was a professor, Dick Craig, at, uh, at Penn State. Some of you might be aware of his work. Um, and he basically said, if you don't know where you are, self. It gives you a pretty good idea. Now, as we talked about with polyploids, doesn't exactly tell you that, but 
at the same time, at least it gives you some information. So it's always a good idea. If you don't know what you're doing, just start there. Make sure you get the right number of plants and the right population sizes um, and you know get, get your plans in line. Uh, and as I would say that I've been accused of being stubborn in my life and it's not always a bad thing, but sometimes it is. I can tell you from personal experience, I had a greenhouse of about 40,000 plants, plus or minus. I think, uh, so I filled up roughly 20 benches. I think I spent maybe three weeks working on 19 of them. I spent two weeks working on one. Why? Because that was the bench that had the weird stuff on it. So, um, and then they killed the program. So, you know, you can tell me if, if you think it's worth it or not. But the point is that I will tell you that even though they killed the program, I did make something special and I did do something kind of cool. So personally, I can tell you from my experience that, that being stubborn is sometimes special. Sometimes you get somewhere where you actually really want to go and you make that breakthrough. Uh, so, but be careful. It will cost you. And, and who knows what it will cost you. It might cost you, uh, it might cost you time at home. It might cost you time out at the, with your friends. It might, who knows what it's going to cost you, or it might cost you your boss saying, what are you doing? All right. So, but like I said, be careful, but nonetheless, it, it, it might be, it might be required that you're a little stubborn from time to time. So finally, thank you for your attention. Now I like to, I like to uh, end with this picture because this was one of my favorite lantana plants that I made. Now, uh, when I was looking at this plant in the field for a while, it looked like Mickey mouse. Then eventually it started, you know, hold on. Then eventually it started looking like a heart. And then when I took, but then when I was taking photos in the field, I just went click, click, click. And then upon uh, further review, I was like, you know what? I really wish I had taken that picture from the other direction because then I would actually have a very nice lantana heart. So I kind of take this as a, as, an, as a moment to say, every once in a while, you should step back and think about what you're doing before you actually do it. Because if I had done that in that one moment, I'd have the picture I want, not the picture I have. All right. Well, thank you. Um, we still have about uh, eight minutes for the book. So if there's any questions, uh, now we, have to ask. we don't have refreshments. So once we're back to read, we can head over to the yeah, No refreshments today. We have one. Announcement like that. I just have a photo. Are we going to have to get it to you? <coughs> like, like you would yeah yeah there was some guy that was uh, working on it right after him or actually i think there was there was a guy that gen that i think published um around the same time, I can't remember, you know, that, that person, their name obviously gets lost to history, but I think they published it uh, first or it was in a, it was, but then basically they realized that Mendel actually did it first or something like that. But yeah, it was a uh, very fortunate that he I'm did. He no. Yeah, it was, it was very, very fortunate for him that, that he did that. Uh, I, you know, when I was working with Lantana, you know, I, maybe I was the right person, right person, right place, right time, or, Maybe I just got lucky or who knows, but, uh, you know, I had a, I had a girlfriend at the time, you know, it was, it was actually kind of nice because we had a really good relationship in the sense that she thought that I was smarter than her. And I thought that she was smarter than me, but she said, I couldn't have figured that one out. And I was like, oh, maybe you could have, who knows, but nonetheless, uh, it was, it was a really interesting program. And, you know, it was kind of one of these things where, you know, you're just like sitting there and like all these things are swirling in my brain and, you know, you're just thinking about Lantana, you know, all day. And all, and you wake up in the morning at uh, you know five o'clock in the morning. Oh man, I've got to go do some more flow cytometry. And I can't tell you how many nights uh, I was doing flow cytometry until ten or eleven o'clock at night. And it was just thousands and thousands of samples to confirm all that. So, um, so the leaves got a little bit uh, more heart shaped. They tend to be more like lanceolate when they're when they're lower ploidy levels. Um, not exactly, they're not exactly that type, but a little bit more heart shaped. Uh, they got thicker, which was you know some of the standard things that you would expect. Uh, but what happened was normally in the diploids, you had somewhere in the so the the flowers are all on sort of like a, a a peduncle or a head, 
And in the diploids, you would wind up with a range of something like maybe 25 to 35, maybe up to 40 or so individual flowers per, per head or, or per peduncle. And then what would happen is uh, when you got to the higher ploidy levels, the number of flowers would start to decrease. And then the individual flower size would start to increase. Uh, so that was that was kind of fell in line with some of the things that you would also expect. But uh, the, the, the plant habit, the stems started to get a little bit coarser. The texture of the plant got a little bit harsher. Um, leaves got a little thicker, you know, and the, 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 the morphology changed a bit. But then also the flowers were the big place where you really saw some, some differences. Um, I would have liked to work on it a little bit more and, and uh, look into that um, for, for another year or two, but just, you know, had to go make money. You know, the, the, the job of a graduate student is to graduate, right? So uh, that was kind of what, what was the next step in my life. Uh, you know, I'm not 100% sure about that. I think it's, I think it's triggered by pollination. So in other words, if you, I think, I think that my suspicion, we never really figured this one out, but my suspicion is that if you, it was triggered by a pollination event, but it wasn't, I don't know that it was required. So that's. Um, no, because, well, because if the, if the, no. Uh, so if the, if the plant is, if you're looking at making an apomictic progeny, uh, you can, you could have a haploid, which would be, it would, you could, you could have a haploid, which would in some ways help you, or you could have a direct clone of the individual. And if the individual that you had was a heterozygous individual, then you would just have another heterozygous individual. Am I, or am I not understanding your question? I'm, I'm sorry, yeah, it would be a clonal. It, it would, yeah. So it would effectively be a clone in that sense. Um, so it was, did I did I answer the question? Uh, yes. So um, trying to remember, you know, I'm trying to remember. We didn't really study the apomictic part of it too too intensively because it wasn't something that we really figured out until kind of the end. But um, the apomixis, uh, let me think here. No, no, the uh, the apomixis uh, could happen either way. Because in some cases you had you had you had you had reduced uh, you had normally reduced gametes that would go through the process and that would be how you would create uh, haploid, and then we also had unreduced gametes that would go through the process that would create clones. So basically, it was it was irrespective of the process; it would just happen. So my my suspicion is that basically the the plant. So you had a you had a a, a mechanism that was creating uh, gametes sort of on this side, and then you had a mechanism that would allow for apomixis sort of separate and independently from the meiotic process. But I suspect it. I, I suspect that your rates of, of apomixis were increased by and, and triggered by pollination events, but I don't know that for sure. Okay, yes. Anybody else have a question? Yes, sir. Howdy. So, all right, so some lines produce unreduced gametes and some do not. All right, so uh, only the ones that, uh, so they were fully intercrossable. So it's kind of like basically saying if this plant was unreduced gamete producer and this one was not, you could cross them freely, it's no problem. But if you had a triploid, because you could effectively have a, a tetraploid and a diploid that were not unreduced gamete producers. And then if you mated them together, you would get a triploid that was highly sterile, okay? But if you crossed a tetraploid or a diploid that had unreduced gametes in its background and you made a triploid with that, then it would carry that gene for the unreduced female gametes. Then you would have a triploid that produced these unreduced gametes. And then when you cross that with a diploid, for example, then it would create a tetraploid, which then restored fertility. Does that make sense? Yeah, just so so that's that's kind of why that you know that that Lantana spaghetti thing is just like basically just always circles back. Now I think that kind of going back to what I was saying about the higher levels of ploidy levels, I think that once it got to a certain level of of increase, I think that the um, 
the the vigor and viability of the plant was so low that those individuals didn't really contribute to the population so much as why you didn't really see them. And probably they weren't very attractive. And so because they weren't attractive, no one really propagated them to make them part of the, the palette. Does that, that take care of it for you? Okay. Yeah, if you want to ask questions, get me on the second or third glass of wine, you'll get a much better. Yeah. 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 Uh, so I, I'm trying to remember. Um, I don't believe that we did because there weren't a lot of diploids that we had that had that those those traits to them. Um, but you know, I, I would say that a true haploid is. A, you know, if you have a tetraploid and you get a diploid from it, it is a true haploid. But what you're talking about is a one n. No, I don't. I don't. I, I don't believe that we had any of those. Um, if if my memory serves, I mean, you know, it's been a while, but I don't believe we had them. And if if I did, I probably would have mentioned it. So. Yeah, all of them. I mean, to my knowledge, there really aren't any seed propagated lantana that's commercially available. Um, you could, um, you you could, you could try that. We didn't, we didn't take that approach. We we believed that using the the you know what was available to us, which is the ploidy level manipulation uh, and trying to get to a product. We believe that was a more straightforward process for us, but you're right. You absolutely could have tried uh, mutation or irradiation and perhaps achieved a better result. Stabilizing uh, mutated plants is not as easy. I've tried it. It's not as easy as uh, maybe making the cross though, <laughs> but you're right. It, it absolutely could have worked. All right. Well, if you wait, please do.